All right. Good morning. Uh, I got to start off this morning by asking you an important theological question. Today's December 13th. So when does the 12 days of Christmas start? Was that today or Christmas yesterday or Christmas it starts on Christmas and then goes after Christmas? Christmas. See, I, didn't, I knew I've. I don't. Well, I have a. I got a gift that was like the twelve office socks of Christmas or whatever. Like, so I can't. But I don't know when I'm supposed to. But apparently, I got to wait till after Christmas now. That's unfortunate. All right. Um, well, there are certainly some things in life that I firm, firmly believe um, cannot be overstated. Ever, you'll never be able to overstate them. Um, for example, like my my first view of a of a fully starlit sky. Um, I'll show you a picture in just a second. Um, but, uh, it's like, somebody could say, oh, it's, it's real big, it's really beautiful, it's, uh, lots of stars, <laughs> and it's like, I can fathom it as best as I can, but, it, but there's, I'm literally never going to be able to go to a fully starlit sky without any light pollution and be like, oh yeah, that's pretty underwhelming, like, it's, it's unable to be overstated about how amazing it truly is, um, or, for example, the Grand Canyon, you know, the, the, I imagine the first people going and seeing it, and they're like, this thing's pretty cool. <laughs> what are we going to call this thing? I don't know. Let's call it Grand. Yeah, let's call it Grand. Like you'll, and so you look at the Grand Canyon, and you're like, it must be Grand. And then you go see it, and it's like, I, I can't verbalize the beauty. I can't comprehend how to communicate this to you. You just have to experience it. Like there, there's no way I'll ever be ready just mentally, just from it being explained to me. Um, if you're not like nature freak, then maybe like, you know, the first time holding your child, right? Like there's, there's nothing that you can do to prepare yourself for the amount of love that you will, the, the sacrifice you're willing to make for that child is like everything to you upon, upon holding it for the first time. Uh, life and words will never do it justice. Um, today we're talking about Isaiah 53, which is considered to be the Mount Everest of the Bible, if you will. It's one of the um, most insane passages ever, and I'm really excited to talk about it, and I'm going to be verbally frustrated the entire time because there's no way I can do it justice verbally. It is just so insane. The presence of God, the gospel of God is... It's mind-blowing, and I hope that after today we can just have some more appreciation for it, um, but I know that there's no way I'll be able to do it full justice, so I just ask the Lord would humble our hearts and, and prepare our hearts and would speak to our lives and our spirits would be just in sync and that we would grasp even just a sliver of the, um, the vastness of the gospel of God that was written 700 years before the gospel. So this is looking back at looking forward to looking back at the gospel. So what I mean by that is uh, Isaiah's time is the green dot there. That's like the time of Isaiah, 700-ish years before the time of Christ. And then Jesus comes after that. The prophecy we're about to read in Isaiah 53 is about the future looking of the Jews looking back on Jesus saying, oh, we missed, we missed it. He was our Messiah. He was, so here we are looking back at Isaiah who was looking forward to Jews in the future who were looking back at Jesus going, oh my goodness, he was the Messiah. So that's, that's the way the prophecy works. But I think it's a really profound way to do a prophecy rather than just say, hey, here he comes. It's really unique, not only literarily, but also just like emotionally weird to see and be able to capture the emotion of true, deep sorrow and regret that you missed it. That the Jews were, that they they said, we've heard of him. We knew, you're going to see it in the scriptures. And they say, but we, we we didn't think it. We didn't know it. We didn't believe it. And here it is over and over. And so now we get the luxury of seeing it. Um, but just as, as we read this, try to grasp just the emotional um, breadth of the, of the passage and the sorrow and regret of, of what it would mean to miss your Messiah. And so we're still hoping for this day for the Jews that they would come back fully and all believe in their Messiah. But um, until then, we're still quite not there yet. Um, I want to give you the context. Um, Isaiah 53 is the fourth of what we call the servant songs. Um, that is where there's four passages in Isaiah. Isaiah uh, 42, which Drew preached on, 49, Jordan preached on, and then 50, and then 52. 
Um, and each one of these, I can't give you the full uh, context, but this is one of the most debated pa passages like ever between Jews and Christians because it's so clearly talking about Messiah, but the Jews don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So they have to do something with this passage. So there's massive, massive, massive arguments over whether or not we're talking about the people of Israel or, the, uh, or Jesus. I don't have time to go over that because I don't believe that you guys need to hear that argument. I don't think I'm speaking to a Jewish audience that needs to be persuaded that way. Um, however, I did a lot of apologetical research, and in fact, I, I just I love uh, how much of this text points to the New Testament. So I did a project on that, and um, Eric's going to post that on the Facebook page. I would highly recommend it. It's basically every, not every, it's not even close to exhaustive. Uh, it's Isaiah 53 of many allusions, references, direct quotes, or the narrative that plays out what we're going to talk about today. Um, and it's just riddled with, I mean, it, there's a, a verse doesn't go by where there's not something in the New Testament about it. So if that's like, you know, it's something you have a passion for the truth of Scripture and the intertextuality of Scripture and you love God's Word or you want to grow in love for God's Word um, or you want to show your family how to study God's Word, that's going to be on the Facebook page later this afternoon. I would highly recommend that you go do that and just have a fun afternoon of just look, reading the verse in Isaiah and then go finding uh, the, like a, a cross-reference or a direct quote in the New Testament. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, and then there's also... Uh, the four servant songs slowly lead up to what looks like it could be talking about the Jewish people, but also a messianic type of feel to it of like there's things that they do that the Jewish people can't do for themselves. And then that slowly grows away from Jewish people and it makes it pretty clear that it's somebody distinct. Um, as you go from 42 to 49 and then 51 is when it makes it really clear. He says, I turned my back, I uh, opened my back for them to wound and they pulled my, the beard out of my face. Like first person singular. Um, it starts to make it very clear. This isn't talking about a Jewish people, the remnant of Israel that's going to uh, that's going to save the people. This is somebody else. And then when we get into 53, um, it's just too far away from being a, a group of people. This is clearly a singular Messiah. In fact, early Jewish scholars thought there would be two Messiahs because they were so confused about why is there one that triumphs and one that suffers? This was always understood to be a messianic idea until Jesus came and they rejected him as Messiah. Then they said, well, now we have to think of something else of a different way. And it wasn't until 200 years after Christ, when Origen first had the, we, we first read in history of the argument that this is for the Jewish people. So I, I don't want to go into any of that anymore. If you want to talk, we can. Um, but just, we believe as Christians, this is so super messianic and it's talking about Jesus. And that's where we're going to be at from here. So I don't want to go into any more historical stuff. Um, we can do it later. All right. So Isaiah 53, the servant song actually starts in, um, 52 verse 13. So when I say Isaiah 53, I'm talking about 52, 13 to the end of 53. So I'm just going to say that for convenience sake. Um, but we're going to read it all the way through. And then I'm going to, we're going to, as we read it all the way through, um, then I'll go and we'll look at some new, some new passages that I don't have here. So if you have a Bible ready, I would recommend that you have it ready. Um, because we're going to read some stuff that I don't have slides for, and I just feel kind of like traditional. I don't know, I'm reading my Bible, got my, you know, Merry Christmas sweater vest on. So we're going to do some more of that um, instead of using all the technology. All right, so let's just read. And then I also, feeling kind of uh, traditional, let's, I'd like to, if you're able to stand for the reading of God's Word, because we're going to read it all in one chunk. So please, if you would with me, stand as we read Isaiah 52, <clears throat> 13 through the end of 53. <clears throat> Behold, my servant shall act wisely. Oh, we're not reading it all together. Sorry, sorry. Just standing alone. Sorry. <laughs> if you're if you're online, there's some friends reading along with this, but I'll, I'll clarify. My apologies. Um, just me, but we're gonna all stand together. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that, and that which they have not heard they understand. 
Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up, <clears throat> he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should des- desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as far and and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Transgressors. Wow. Uh, Let me pray. Father, there's no way I'm going to be able to overstate the power of your gospel, uh, the truths here that you came as a human being. The God of the universe became a human. The God of the universe became a human. That the God of the universe became a human and that we killed him. And we killed him. And you did it for us. I will never be able to overstate that truth. Would you humble our hearts as we read this today together. Would you help me speak clearly? Would you stir up in our hearts affection for you and for your word and for your truths? Help us delight, a reinvigorated joy for your, for your love for us, deep sorrow and regret for our sin, and a preparation for Advent. Would you just stir in us deeply this morning? In Jesus' precious name, amen. <clears throat> so, Let's uh, just go over a bit of this, and then I'll highlight some some key things. Um, uh, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. So the only other, one of the few other times this is used, this phrase, shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted, is Isaiah 6 in the, in the temple room that Isaiah quotes. He's, he's talking about a servant, but he's talking about God. Um, which is where we intro start to Jesus as Messiah. Um, As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. Uh, In other words, he's going to get beat to a pulp so bad that you won't even want to look at him. You won't even know. uh, We won't even know that he's a person. You wouldn't be able to recognize who he is. This person is going to take such a beating, his appearance will be so marred that we're going to be astonished. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine watching that? Like, we have have movies. Certainly would be rated R. I mean, if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, but even that, probably was worse than that. can't imagine getting beat so badly that I'd you can't even recognize. Can you imagine his mother watching your son get beat so badly you don't even know what he looks like anymore? The, we're going to cover later how much God hates sin and sinners. And it's 
don't want to lose sight of that. That that's that's such a beating. <laughs> that's so much wrath. That's so much anger. And I really don't want to lose sight. So shall he sprinkle many nations. We're going to come back to that um, in a bit. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told which they see and that which they have uh, not heard they understand. Uh, This is one of the quotes in the New Testament. Um, Paul uses it as an argument of why we just keep telling people the gospel. Keep on telling them that those who haven't heard it, tell them so they can hear it. Um, It's in Romans 15. I can't remember. I've, I've looked up so many stinking references. I don't know if it's 15 or 16, but go check. It's, it's going to be on the paper. Um, that's there. <clears throat> Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been, been revealed? That's a rhetorical question. It's, we're talking about Israel here. Who, who else has gotten to witness and see? The servant song before this in Isaiah 51, um, he, talks about, he talks about that. Who has gotten to... Uh, know this, and then he goes through things like, um, oh, I'm going to lose sight of it here. Isaiah 50. The Lord has given me the tongue and taught, the Lord has opened my ear, but the Lord God helped me that I have not disgraced, set my face, back to, oh, I'm not reading the right part. Oh, well. We'll go on. We'll move on. Anyway, it moves on of Isaiah 50. I don't know where my notes went. Um, and uh, how we're, we're clearly talking about the goodness of the goodness of God. All right, where am I at? <clears throat> For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Um, so basically, here comes the savior of the world and he's going to be meek. He's going to be like a nobody. He's going to be like, if we were to do this um, in today's society, let's pretend that the Messiah hadn't come yet. And here we are in Portland, Oregon, 2020. Let's just pretend. And then all of a sudden you hear of some person in Yakima, Washington, who's like saving the world. You're like, Yakima? Can anything good come out of Yakima? Like, that's what they said. Well, like Jesus of Nazareth. They're like, can anything good did anything good come from Nazareth? Like, what do you, like, he came from nowhere. He came from Bethlehem and Nazareth. He came from what is the, what we would consider the God of the universe. What the, all the Jews were waiting for is this miraculous inception of God and incarnation of God. And it's just some nobody from Bethlehem that's a carpenter. And then when he speaks, he changes the world. He, he heals the blind and he heals the broken and he casts out demons and he shows the power of God and he shows his divinity and he's coming from nothing. And Isaiah 53 is just showing that. Look, they didn't believe him because he came from as a nobody, but that was the point. God loves using the weak to display his power. The God of the universe became a human to save humans. Like he, it's just so amazing, so mind-blowing to me that he would do this in such a way that is so counterintuitive. It's truly, truly beautiful. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, saying, the Jews said, we wanted to crucify him because we thought he was a blasphemer. And we said, he's getting what he deserved. He's getting what he deserves. There Jesus is up on the cross, getting beat, punished, crucified. And the Jews are saying he is being punished by God. He's cursed. He's on a tree. And they're missing it that he's, he's doing it for us. He's taking on our curse on the tree. He's taking our beating on that cross. But we're the ones that are there. And, and the Jews were saying, look at him being stricken and smitten by God. And it's completely backwards. We're the ones that should have been stricken and smitten by God, and he took it for us. He was pierced through. The verb, the, the, the word there is he was pierced through for our transgressions. This, again, 700 years before the crucifixion, and it's specific stuff to a crucifixion-type death. It's truly amazing. Uh, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities that brought us peace And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned 
every one to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. We are all born with a propensity to sin that God had to fix. Uh, we live in a time where the status of our heart is sin- sinful. In other words, upon conception, we have the, uh, the highest thing in our heart is not God. It's something other than God. And that leads us to constantly do things like sin. We put anything else in front, whether it be our job or money or another human being or a concept of love or of, of a certain virtuous thing like tolerance or whatever. We have a propensity to always put something on the throne of our heart that's not God. And God has to fix that. God has to fix that in our hearts to say, I'm the only one that belongs on the throne there. Anything short of that is, uh, is worthy of damnation, right? Uh, John says um, that for those who believed in his name became saved, but those who didn't, they, st- they stand condemned already. They're already on the chopping block as guilty of sin. This is what Isaiah says, that all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. All of us. All of us at some point have actively said, God, I choose not you. Fill in the blank. I choose not you. I choose something else. I don't want you. And he had to turn our hearts around and change our hearts to where uh, he can make a way. And we'll get into that in a second. Uh, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. If you read um, in the gospel accounts when Jesus is in front getting charged uh, for his thing narratively, uh, that's also in the thing that's going to be posted on Facebook. But they say, don't you realize that I have the power to save you? Like, you know, are you guilty or not? And it says he remained silent. There he is. Who could, he was innocent, fully innocent, fully able to rescue himself off the cross if he wanted to, he even made a statement. I can call down a legion of angels if I really wanted to, but this is for the plan of God to be fulfilled. And he remained silent, like a lamb before the slaughter. <clears throat> um, I want to get into, so we've talked about um, kind of breaking down the text, and we've talked about sin, our sin nature, that Jesus has to fill our sin nature. Um, and we understand this, that in the Old Testament, the only way this happens is through the shedding of blood. Uh, and Hebrews explains that. So we're going to turn to Hebrews 9, if you will, as I open it up. But Hebrews 9 uh, is where we're going to read. But basically, it's the argument of how did we turn from he, uh, the Old Testament of animal sacrifice to Jesus fulfilling that sacrifice. So let's turn to Hebrews 9, and we'll read uh, 11 through 28. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have to come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but of the means by his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So before, the only way you get into the presence of God is through somebody else's blood. And this is saying, you know how Jesus did it? Through his own blood, his eternal blood. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of, de- of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who's, who through the eternal, uh, uh, eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God to purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that, that those who are called many... <clears throat> may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For will takes effect only at death, since it is not enforced as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For whenever every commandment of the law has been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded you and in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels and worshiped and indeed everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins 
Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sac sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place, places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But, that, but as it is, he has appeared once for all by the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting. So Hebrews makes it really clear to us this amazing idea um, that we call substitutionary atonement. And that's the answer, this major riddle of the Old Testament. This major riddle of the Old Testament is that God calls himself angry and wrathful towards sinners, and he demonstrates it all the time. I remember looking at an atheist website, and they used this argument to, they used it to deny that God exists, and what they basically had was all the quotes of the Old Testament where God just kills people. And then they used that as to say, see, look, God is you know evil and terrible and whatever. But I remember thinking that and being like, that's terrifying. Like the God of the Old Testament kills people all the time. Like he's wrathful and angry. We we're in Isaiah. The entire Bible has been filled with him judging and then redeeming and judging and redeeming. And there's this weird paradox of he hates and is wrathful towards sin, but then constantly shows mercy and saves. And then he does this eternally. So in the Jewish system before we had animal sacrifice that you sin and then there had to be a guilt offering where a blood is shed to cover it. The sin is so uh, grievous that, that something's gonna die. God is so holy, something is going to die when you sin. It's either gonna be you or something else and he, so he created this system of animal sacrifice, vicarious sacrifice, substitutionary sacrifice so that way it takes the place of and Hebrews tells us Jesus comes to the world to do that. And Isaiah 53 tells us this. Isaiah 53 says that he laid on him the sins of us all. That Jesus took the place on our behalf, uh, that he was pierced through for our transgressions. Right? The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. That he took on all of that anger and wrath from God, all for one that he took it and he doesn't have to suffer over and over and over and over again because he needed to be human in order to cover and atone for human sin, but he needed to be divine to give us and impute the righteousness of God. So when Jesus, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus' righteousness covered, paid for, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And it's in Isaiah 53 written 700 years before Christ. I mean, it's so incredible and there's no way I'm doing this justice because this is the most fascinating, amazing concept of scripture and reality of our lives that the God of the universe loved us so much that he uh, made a way for us to be with him by dying for us. The only way it could be done. That he himself, there's nothing we could do in any way. The difference of every other religion and what we believe, you know, do something about it. And God says, you can't. You can't do anything about it. I'll do it for you. I'll die for you. It's absolutely incredible. I hope, I just pray that you guys would love God so much. Like it is the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. The love of God to do that. When we are the, what Romans says, when we, we are the least of sinners, uh, the, what, yeah, that he, Christ died for us. We're enemies with God. And he made it right with us. Not, that's what Jesus tells us to, uh, to love our enemies. And do, he says, what credit do you get if you love somebody who loves you back? The one, you know who demonstrated the most love possible? To love someone who hates you. To love someone who beats you. To love someone who wants your, uh, f wants your like, cruelty in your life. Wants you to fall. Jesus did it already. He did it for us. He did it for us. It is so, absolutely so amazing. And it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Uh, we're in verse, Isaiah 53, verse 10. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, 
he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul shall see and be, he shall see and be satisfied. And so we have the wrath of God satisfied. Remember that old hymn, the wrath of God is satisfied. Here it is. There's a, there is a cup of punishment that is due to humans and Jesus drinks all of it. That's, that's another way we think of it is that Jesus drinks the full cup of wrath of God towards humans. All of it is completely atoned for and he substitutes our sin onto him and then imputes onto us his right, perfect righteousness. It's the most amazing trade ever. Absolutely incredible. Out of the anguish of his soul, <clears throat> oh, I already read that one. Uh, by his knowledge shall be a righteous one, my servant make many to be accounted righteous. Uh, just real quick, I want to turn to Romans 5. This is where we talk about the one person for the many. You know, how is that fair? How is that fair that one gets to die for many? And uh, the argument is from Paul in Romans 5. Um, he's, it's Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as one sin, or just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though, even over those who were sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Um, so in, uh, I'll read one more verse. For if because... Uh, one man's death reigned through through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the man, one man, Jesus Christ. So in other words, he's saying the one man justifies all, that there is punishment due and Jesus drinks the full cup of the punishment and then now we are in a state of called justification. This is why First John says that we are when we confess our sins, we are he, God is faithful and, and just to forgive us, meaning it is in right standing in his mind to forgive us when we say we believe and we've sinned. That not only is he like, okay, it's, I, I'm, I'm pardoning you and that is justified because that sin is paid for, debt accounted for. Uh, there is nothing owed for this. Jesus took it on. Absolutely so incredible. Um, so I want to move on to uh, the last part of it, of how, how do we respond to this? Um, uh, one would be to take sin seriously. I, I, I can't overstate it, right? I, as, I grow, as, as I grow in my Christianity, the obviousness of my sin goes down, uh, but the wickedness that I experience in my heart goes up. And what I mean by that is, there might not be, as you, as you grow in Christianity, there might not be like the major sins, you know, like I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I don't cheat on my wife anymore, but not a day goes by. The closer I get to God, not a day goes by where I don't go, oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, oh I, I, I am so wicked to the core. I mean, Isaiah has an experience with God and he says, woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Paul says, oh, wretched man, I'm the, I'm the least of, all of the saints. The closer we get to God, the more we realize the vast gap between us and God and the necessity for the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us, even though the obviousness of this sin might be from the world standard, they'd be like, you're a great person. And I'm going, if you only knew what I thought, if only you could take every thought in my head and put it on a screen and look at it, I would be devastated. I'm so wicked, and if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would be doomed. Absolutely doomed. Because his holiness is so incredible that he should rightfully punish. He should rightfully punish the evil and wickedness. He could evaporate all of humankind, and we wouldn't be able to argue that it's bad because we are sinful and wicked. And yet he doesn't do that. 
and he crushes and punishes himself out of his love. So one thing is that you would take your sins seriously and recognize how sinful we are. Uh, Tim Keller's way of describing the gospel is that we are more sinful than we would ever recognize, um, but we are more loved than we would ever know. Um, and that's the second part is that you would, uh, can you go to the next slide? That remember how much God loves you. That as much anger and hatred as he has towards sin and sinners that he's willing to punish and crush all sin, he did, he did it through Jesus Christ for you. That he made a way for you. And I don't mean for mankind. I mean, it says that our, our names are written in the book of life before. He did this with a predetermined plan to love you. He called you out of darkness into light. He loves you. He wants to guide your life with him for eternity. He loves you. I can't, I can't say it enough or overstate it that the God of the universe thinks upon you and loves you. He loves you so much. Oh, like Romans said, like, oh, the depth of the love of God. I, I can't fathom it. God loves you so much. I, I just, there's no words. There's no words. Would you just, oh God, help us know the love that you have for us. We would be satisfied every day. It was an ocean that we would never, ever see the end of, ever. And that's what it's going to be like for eternity, ever increasing joy, more joy than the next day. There's even more joy and more love. And the next day there's even more joy and more love. And the next day there's even more joy and more love in our love with God. It's every day. How incredible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I know I stumbled through Isaiah 53, but I trust your truths to sink into our hearts. I trust your goodness and your Holy Spirit that you would um, make yourself known to us. Would you please uh, stir in our hearts how truly depraved we are, how sinful we are, um, and yet be constantly reminded of how much you love us. Would we be ever grateful and satisfied and delight and joyful and immune to the stresses of the world because we know we are held dear in, in the eyes of the maker of the universe, that you have our, our best interests, that you love us, you care for us, you're going to look out for us. And all this time in 2020, we know that you love us so much that you would die for us. Help us to uh, step one step closer to understanding that today and moving into this week. Help us to know how much you love us. Help us to stay, run from sin and run into your loving arms all day, every day. In Jesus' name, amen.